Welcome to EuroPCR 2024. I am Nicolas Famigam from the Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam. Today in Paris, uh, we are going to discuss the clinical experience with the Duravar THV, a new biomimetic TAVI uh, platform. And for that, I am uh, joined by two pioneering trailblazing interventional cardiologists, but also good friends. There is Azim Latip from New York, and there is also Chris Meduri from uh, Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden. So first of all, uh, Chris, um, bring us up to speed to the history or with the history of Duravar and this tissue development program. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Nick, and again, great to be here with both of you guys today. Um, so, you know, Anteris is actually a company that has been working on tissue for the last 25 or 30 years. Uh, it started with a pediatric cardiac surgeon recognizing the issues with calcification in pediatric cardiovascular patches and surgical repairs. He spent 30 years essentially developing this tissue, which is now FDA approved and called the ADAPT or tissue technology sold under the label of CardioCell. It's been used in over 55,000 patients worldwide now. So we're really excited. There's a large tissue experience with this company. So how would this fit in in the TAVI space? So that's a great question. So they had this tissue that's been approved and being used in patients for years. And then the question came, what do we do in the TAVR space? How do we actually make something that's not just another Me Too, which we see a lot of times in this space, right? I mean, that's all we seem to be seeing here this week. Mm. And the idea was, why don't we stop trying to mimic what the other TAVR devices are doing? And instead try to mimic what the healthy aortic valve is doing. And I think when you see this valve and technology, you really see this isn't chasing every other company, it's chasing what actually we were all born with instead. And when you see that, the only way that could be done was by taking this unique tissue, instead of cutting into three pieces like the traditional aortic valves and transcatheter valves or surgical valves, it molded it. And by molding a single piece of tissue, it's really developing a new class of valve, a biomimetic valve. And that molding allows it to have its long coaptation length and open really all the way up. And we see resultantly different clinical features and clinical responses to that as well. And of course, then we wanted to build that on an easy to use platform. If we make a great valve, but it's not easy to get in, it's a different story. So we built it with a 14 French delivery system, expandable sheath, commissure alignment, crimped directly onto the balloon on the back table there, incredibly easy to put in. So talking about clinical experience, Azim, you are one of the first to have like more extended experience with this platform. What do you what do you think? Yeah, so like Chris mentioned, this is a balloon expandable platform and I'd say, you know, a current generation because it was designed specifically to address some of the shortcomings of what we've seen before with valves. So the clinical experience right now there's a first in human experience of 41 patients and then an EFS experience in the United States of 15 patients, so about 56 patients treated worldwide with this device. And you see what you would expect with a balloon expandable technology. It's reproducible, good procedural outcomes, you get to implant the valve where you want, you can do the commercial alignment, so you've had very, very good clinical outcomes, low pacemaker rates, almost no, uh, no PVL, so very little PVL. But I think what's really stood out for me has been the hemodynamics. I mean, we all talk about it now. We're all talking about hot what's, topic. it's hot a hot topic. topic. It's yeah, everything yeah. we've been talking about, yeah, right? Yeah. Lifetime management and how do we give a patient one valve that will last as long as possible? I mean, that's really the, I think, the what we're all seeking in Tava, right? Yeah, yeah. This valve is showing some really interesting and excellent early outcomes as far as hemodynamics. So what we're seeing, and at the procedure, but also at 30 days, is EOAs above 2, 2.2, gradients, mean gradients that are single digits on echo, okay, uh, and DVIs of like 0.61 to 0.65. Now, you see it at the time of the procedure, we're seeing it at 30 days, and the patients who are getting to one year are also having these durable and favorable outcomes. Now, I think for all of us, when we see that, you know, it's a good sign that this valve potentially is going to last longer than we've seen with other valves that maybe don't have as good hemodynamic outcomes. Yeah, and current thinking really links acute hemodynamic valve performance to potentially durability over time. How do we explain this, this hemodynamic, this stellar hemodynamics? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, the thing is, if you just make another valve like every other one is, you're going to get similar results. And this is a valve that's short-framed, intraannular, but because of this shaping of a single piece of tissue, it allows you to open much more larger. 
And not only does it provide better heme dynamics, but it offers a lot of other things that I think we're just learning are important signals around durability. You, what you can see is that, again, this tissue we know has a very robust anti-calcification properties. That's just one component of durability. You see, if you look at a TE image, that this has this lengthy coaptation length. So it's about seven to eight millimeters in length on average. And what this length does is we, it reduces stress on the leaflets, which when you're beating, you know, 70, 80 times a minute, over the years has significant impacts on durability. Additionally, unlike most other valves, this valve does not pinwheel in almost any scenario. And so what we see is it is not as subjected to over or undersizing other technologies, and this valve just opens and closes nicely. And I think what's also maybe the most important unique feature of this is its laminar flow. And you see this on TEE and other imaging modalities that it really allows you not to have a turbulent flow like we see in a lot of other technologies, but truly laminar flow coming out beat to beat. And this has also been demonstrated by MRI, obviously. So these, these uh, flow reversal patterns, is that, is that something relevant? Is that real? So I think we're learning about this, right, Nick? I mean, we're trying to figure out how do we understand now how a valve is going to be 10 to 15 years from now, because we don't want to wait 10 to 15 years to know if this valve is going to give us good outcomes. So there's this whole new concept, which for me has been new, laminar flow. I mean, could you actually measure laminar flow? I didn't think you could. And so now we've seen this interesting data from flow with, with cardiac MRI. So there are these incredible pictures showing, you know, what a normal healthy aortic valve looks like and how the flow coming out is laminar and not turbulent. And then you compare that to a stenotic aortic valve where there's a lot of turbulence. And then you see what a normal balloon expandable valve we use every day or self-expandable valve has, and you compare Dura AVR. And I'm no expert in cardiac MRI, but when you look at these pictures, you see that the Duravar valve looks very similar to a healthy aortic valve. Is that good? I think it is. I think if we have better hemodynamics and better laminar flow along with commissural alignment, I think it is going to impact durability, potentially also other things like maybe thrombosis or valve degeneration. So I think there's a lot to learn here. Is, is that what we can expect, a return to laminar flow after a Duravar implant? We know that it has much better laminar flow than the other technologies. And we think it's also important because, you know, as you're having to have more turbulent flow coming out of the ventricle, it requires the ventricle to work harder, mm. right? And we all know that harder work on a ventricle, as we've seen with hypertension and other things, it has predictions of mortality over time. So we've seen really remarkable reductions in LV mass, global longitudinal strain that we're going to show more in future dates. But I think it's a really important thing we're going to be looking at more and more with all devices in the future. What about the future clinical portfolio? Are there new trials coming? So, absolutely. You know, one of the things I should mention about the first in human data is that we did this with one valve size, mm. a small valve in small annuli. So these were patients between with a 21 to 24 millimeter and annuli. And still these hemodynamics. And we got those hemodynamics. Yeah. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. So I think now what we need to do is test this in, the, in a real world with multiple valve sizes in a large randomized study all risk groups against commercial valves. And that's what the global pivotal study will be. It'll be all risk groups, Duravar, three sizes at least, against commercial valves, and in, multi, in, in all risk groups in multiple sites around wow. the world. That's impressive. All right, well, thank you, Azim. Thank you, Chris, for bringing us up to speed to the Duravar program, but also showing and demonstrating the potential of, bio, of this biomimetic valve technology. It's a unique technology in the market but definitely something to look forward to, but also it will be supported by an enormous clinical program that helps us to choose the best valve for our patients. So thank you for, for being with us. Goodbye.